webinar. All right. Thank you and good evening, everybody. And thank you so much for joining this webinar um, today. It's exciting to see you all. Um, thank you for, for making time to be here on a Sunday evening. Um, we understand you all have very important things you're trying to do, but yeah, this is quite important and I'm, I'm excited that you're able to make out time for this. Without wasting much of your time, um, we're just going to go right into the webinar. We're streaming on Facebook, so just in case you, you are curious and you think, okay, um, where else can I find this? If for any reason you step out of Zoom, you can find us on, on Facebook and then this same presentation is going to be going on there. All right. So to get us started, I will just um, put up the screen. OK, good. Um, let me share my sound. Great. OK. One second. Sorry. Apologies for that. Um, I think I'm mixing up this screen share, but it's close this. Okay, good. All right. Just want to confirm, can you see my screen? All right. Are you here? Can you see our screen? Just please give me- Yes, a we can see the screen. Great, great, great. So um, what is this webinar all about? Demystifying STEM education. Um, so a lot of people hear the word STEM. STEM has become a very important buzz word, if I should use that word, if I should say buzz. Buzz is, yeah, buzz is now a buzz word. Uh, we're STEM, we're doing STEM, we're doing STEM here and there. But what exactly it is? I've had privileges to talk with educators, to talk with school um, teachers, and I realized that there's a major misconception in that space. And so what we're going to be doing, hopefully this evening, is just trying to answer that question, what is STEM and why does it matter? And I, I reckon that in this room today, there are more educators, more teachers than just, um, even though I can see that there are parents and a few other people, but basically, what is it and how do we um, take advantage of it as educators, as parents, and as people who are interested in education. But just to give us a background, I'm going to be doing something. I'm going to be, um, you could write it in the chat box. When you hear the word STEM, what comes to your mind? You could just write it wherever you are. Now, when you hear the word STEM, so we say, um, I mean, you've had companies saying we're a STEM club, we're a STEM academy, we're a STEM this. When you hear the word STEM, I want to know in one word or in one phrase, what comes to your mind? Just drop it in the chat box there and let's, Let's, um, I'm going to be reading it out. Someone say science, okay? Yeah, when you hear STEM, you hear the word science. Fantastic, because yeah, science comes in. What comes to my mind is science and technology. Okay, of course, STEM, if you do, in case you are joining us and you've never heard the word STEM, STEM actually means science, technology, engineering, and math. So when you hear the word STEM, someone says coding. Fantastic. When you hear the word STEM, you just think of coding. Another says coding and technology. Great. I mean, those are... Those are the things that come to your mind. Someone says, ah, my child is learning STEM. And that says innovation. Hmm, I love that. Innovation. When you hear STEM, here yeah, so STEM is synonymous with innovation. Someone says bedrock. Hmm, that's interesting. Uh, I'm not sure I know where that is coming from, but it's more like foundation, if I understand you right. So when you hear the word STEM, you think science, you think technology, you think innovation, you think um, coding, you think technology, creativity. One says exactly creativity. So, but exactly now, this is, this is the point. STEM has forward science, technology, engineering, and math. But somehow we've been able to link it and associate it with a lot of things in lots of spaces. Things like um, creativity, like someone says, things like innovation, things like um, um, coding, technology, math inventions. That's exciting. It's exciting that we're able to link this world with it. And the, truth, the reason I started with this question is because in reality, there's a lot of misconception around the word STEM. And um, a misconception is not necessarily a misunderstanding. Uh, like we talk about it in school when we say with teachers, misconception and ignorance. Are ignorance is when you don't know something at all. So I'm totally ignorant about this concept. If you ask me what is STEM, nothing comes to my mind. I'm ignorant. But a misconception is when 
you have an understanding, but that understanding you have is rooted on, on some something that is not correct. So um, when we teach, when we talk about misconceptions, for example, we all think the sun is yellow. We believe the sun is yellow because we see something that looks yellow. In reality, the, the sun is not yellow, actually. And that actually, that, that, that creates, that's, that gives us a room to address those misconceptions because the sun is not yellow. So if you think that the sun is yellow, it means that you are, you are not ignorant about the color of the sun, but you think you have a different interpretation. And there are lots of things like that. I mean, if we start going to misconception, it's an entirely different topic that we talk about when we talk with educators. But when you connect STEM to something like coding, for example, there is some level of misconception because you are you are bringing you are you think that okay stem because coding is an expression of stem so yes it's right to link stem with coding but it's way more than that when you think of stem and think of innovation you are not wrong really but stem is a little bit much more than that and the world has in a sense evolved and been going round and round in many ways so what we're going to be doing this evening is just try to address those things but before we dive in let's start with a problem a problem that i believe gave rise to even the entire vibe and buzz that stem generated and what's that problem our world today has a massive thinking deficit when i say thinking deficit what do i mean people are not thinking or people are not adequately thinking um lots of researchers have worked on this topic around the world and it's not just a, it's not just an African problem. It's a global problem. Companies are complaining that they are not getting people with the right level of thinking for the dreams that their companies have around the world. I mean, there's been a research back of American companies, and the average American CEO complains about the level of innovation that fresh graduates bring into companies when they come in. They're like, are these guys even thinking at all? Global is a problem. When we come to Africa, it is a pro problem pro max. We have people who, for no fault of theirs, I would say, but our minds have just never really been activated. And let me give you, let me explain to you. Um, you see, our education systems, our schools promote education, but not thinking promote schooling, people go to school and they're educated. I know I usually ask the question, how did we get to this point? How did Africa end up as a continent full of educated people who create almost nothing? Do you know that Africa, we are, we really, we are a continent that is 23 out of the 28 poorest countries in the world are in Africa. Yet Africa is considered one of the, the, the richest places in terms of natural resources and um, natural deposits because we run schools and educational systems that promotes memorization above thinking. And we value and reward passing of exams with good grades above student creativity. What do I mean? You can go through a school, as long as you can remember what you are told, we say you are educated. So we end up producing people who are educated, in quotes, but all that they have acquired is knowledge. When I mean knowledge, they retain knowledge. In a typical university, where in Nigeria, I understand that there are a few other Africans who are not in Nigeria on this call right now, but in Nigeria, you will agree with me, once you can remember what your lecturer taught you, and you can give it back to him the way he gave you, you can make a first class. In fact, not that you can make a first class, that is about the same way of, um, that's like, that's about the, the only way to make a first class in Nigeria. And Dr. Obuya here says the same thing is happening in most of the US public school system. Unfortunately, I'm surprised to hear that, that even in, I mean, so, and like I said, it's a global problem, but in the chat, she's saying, even in the US, she's joining us from the US right now. And this is the same thing happening. This is, so people just go through school. I mean, we learn all manner of useless things. We memorize things. Uh, the Nile rivers in Africa, how long they are. So River Nile is 9,747 miles long. River Niger is... Did, did, did. Excuse me, of what value is that knowledge to the world, to you, to a person? So we have people who leave schools and they cannot do anything. They can't produce anything. And little wonder, we are seeing so many things we think are problems. Now, this is the real problem. 
people just want to pass exam just so that once I pass my exam and I, I have good grades, I will get admission. I'm going to go on. I'm going to go on. And people have good grades, but give them a job and they cannot produce anything. It's a major, major problem. That is the foundational problem. But you see, this problem manifests as symptoms in so many cases. And what are the symptoms of this problem? Massive unemployment. Today, Nigeria has a 33% general unemployment. Youth unemployment is 57%. You know what that means? Nearly 60%, almost six out of every 10 young Nigerians has no job. The problem is not even the unemployment. The main problem is the unemployability because this is the dichotomy. Young people are saying there's no work. Companies are saying there are no workers. You can put out an advert right now and people are going to apply and you're going to get lots of applications. Yet you will filter through and you're like, who can we hire here? There's no, almost nobody to employ. And that unemployment is not a disease. And like I always say, I mean, if you've heard me say this, I'm, I'm going to be sound like a broken record because I keep saying the same thing. You don't treat symptoms. You treat disease. And then Nat said here, she's in the health sector. When you have typhoid, you run temperature, you feel a headache. Temperature is not your sickness. Headache is not your sickness. Typhoid fever is your sickness. Malaria, or rather, yeah, malaria causes headache. Malaria is the sickness. Headache is not the sickness. Panadol subsidizes headache. So if you take Panadol, you will feel that your headache has gone down. You think you are treating your disease, but all you are treating is the symptom. And as long as you don't address the main disease, you are going to keep on treating this symptom. It will go temporarily and come back. Go and come back. We are in Nigeria. Guys, government has been trying to solve unemployment because they think unemployment is a problem. It is a symptom. And we will keep on fighting symptoms. For the last eight years, we've been running something called Empower. What is Empower? Government shares money, create jobs that really are not jobs. Just if an avenue to give people money. And you think that creating those jobs are going to solve problems. Go and find one person who collected empower for the last eight years who has been empowered. You won't find one. They are back to square one. Because we just keep going. We're, we're treating symptoms. Workplace and economic unproductivity is a massive symptom of the level of education we receive. Good example of this. And I say this a lot. We have industries... And our industries are just extractive, extracting natural resources and raw materials and sending them for development. We apply almost no brain work to it. Here's Nigeria, Africa's, so one of Africa's largest oil producers. We don't refine the oil. What do we do? We put pipe in the ground, drill the oil, ship it, sell it. Some other people apply their mind, refine it, give us petrol, give us gasoline, give us kerosene, aviation fuel, uh, Vaseline, all of the different things that are in crude oil and then sell it back to us. Our own is to collect it from the ground. Their own is to do the thinking. Just a, a show. I mean, and it's not just in that industry. Lots of sectors in Nigeria. We, we export. We export a lot of natural resources, a lot. We just pack them and send them out. I'm aware that Nigeria is one of produces one of the best ginger in the world. Our ginger is in high demand. But go and compare the price of a ton of ginger and how much ginger oil that ton can produce and the price of that oil. You realize that the real person making the money from ginger is not the farmer, it's the processor. And it's not a Nigerian problem. It's an African problem. Our coffee, our cotton, our timber, our cocoa, we export cocoa, we don't make chocolate, we export cotton, we don't make fabric, we export timber, we don't make furniture, we export coffee, we don't make tea. I mean, we just take these things. It's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a reflection of the level of our thinking and the level of education that we have gotten. Massive poverty. Why is poverty a problem? Like I always say, poverty is not a problem. Poverty is a consequence. It's a consequence of something that you have not done. So if people are poor, the solution is not to go and share money to them. It is to address why are they poor? Why can't people produce to make a living for themselves? Educational vices such as exam practices are just, they are just um, symptoms of that disease because everybody believes that once you have passed exam, you are good. So even if you know or you don't know, you want to pass at all costs. So exam practice, the day we shift our focus from grades, exam practice will disappear. 
exam and practice will disappear. The day we shift our focus from grades, now that a result, result, result is the big deal. So people will do everything. The average parent is getting a lesson teacher for their child. Most times, not so that he will understand what they are taught, but so that let the child pass the exam. So we have exam preparation lessons. When a child has an exam, get him a lesson teacher. Let's see, let him pass the exam because we believe that passing exam is the sign that you are educated. But passing exam, I mean, so these are just problems. Lots of, of employed people don't even work in the areas of study. And for me, this is like my newest discovery of, this is my newest assessment of how we can read our education system. Um, so <laughs> I run a software company and I have lots of very smart people in that company. Some of them are on this call. And you will be shocked to know that of the people who are in tech today, probably 80% of them study nothing close to tech. They go to school, spend five rigorous years studying biochemistry, very hard subject, and then come out and come and start learning graphic design. They go to school, study engineering, civil engineering, come out and come and learn fashion design. They go to school, study very complicated courses, but they come out. And the question is, this just tells you that our education is not even in touch with reality at all. Now, why am I saying all of this? I'm specifying this as a problem. This is the problem that actually give rise to STEM education. Because we realize that people are going through school. Yes, they are getting educated, but education does not automatically translate to productivity. And that leads us to what, that's where STEM came. To help bridge these gaps between education and skill, researchers got to work around the world. And I mean, a lot of work has been done about this. A lot of research has been done in this area. Fantastic guys, the likes of, um, I mean, Clayton Christensen, the likes of um, Tony Wagner. People have done amazing work on how do we ensure that our schools prepare people for the real world? And then in the course of research, they began to identify what are the skills required to thrive in the world today? So my child goes to school, or I go to school and I study geology. When I leave school, has geology actually taught me the things needed to survive in the world? Does my geology degree prepare me to succeed in the world, really? So that's the researchers went to work and they came up with something called this the, the global achievement gaps. Seven skills they identified. Now, these seven skills came out of extensive research that these are seven skills that if anybody will succeed in the world, they need these seven skills. These are, they call them essential skills. And while they recognize that they may not be sufficient, I mean, as the world has evolved, more skills have been are now required to succeed. I mean, there are soft skills like empathy, like um, emotional intelligence that are not out of this, a part of the seven global achievement gaps. But these seven skills are considered essentials. If you like have all the empathy in the world, if you don't have these seven, your empathy is taking you nowhere. So now after having these seven, now learn empathy, learn emotional intelligence. And those, those, so that's why these are considered essentials, essentials, critical thinking and problem solving. Guys, critical thinking, no, what is a critical thinking? A lot of people just have this expectation of do it for me. So today, how I was on a flight this morning from Lagos coming to Uruguay, and I saw this teenager on the, on, on the flight. She entered the plane with a very big backpack. The plane had a small cabin. It was a very small plane. And so um, those of us who had seemingly big um, hand luggages, they collected our bags at the foot of the plane to tag for us. But this lady had a backpack, which she entered with. And she was trying to push this backpack into the cabin. And from where I was sitting, this backpack was like one and a half the size of the cabin. It was clear that this stuff cannot go into the cabin. And I was looking at this young girl probably in her around 14, 15, young teenager. I mean, that's my estimation of her age. She stood there and kept on trying to push this bag in. And my mother was like, don't you realize that this bag is not going to go in? And she stood there. And at some point, she just stood there holding the bag and was looking down, waiting for the air hostess to come and tell her what to do. And what I just saw right there, I just to myself, Hi, see, see lack of critical thinking and problem solving. Madam, this bag cannot go in. Take the initiative and figure out what to do next. That is a major problem. A lot of our young people have never been taught how to solve problems. Here you are, it's a real problem. You have a bag, this bag cannot go in. What should you do? Figure it out. That ability to figure it out is what we are calling critical thinking and problem solving. 
Because in the world today, nobody's going to come and give you answers. There are lots of problems, but nobody, if, I mean, the reason why there are no jobs today is because people's expectation of a job is that I go to an office, someone gives me a chair, gives me a table, gives me a file, and then tells me what to do on the file. Expectation is that somebody will tell you what to do. In today's world, nobody's telling anybody what to do. And that's why there are no jobs because people that are expecting you to, to tell them what to do, nobody's having. So it is people who can actually sit down and think. And they say every problem is an opportunity until you're able to look at that problem and convert it to an opportunity. So critical thinking, collaboration across networks. Collaboration is an important essential for success. Being able to work with people across networks, across board. And you know the funny part? They are telling us that we need collaboration to succeed in the world. But our education system is telling us the opposite, that you have to work alone. When it's time for exam or test, what do we tell students? We, we, we split the chairs far apart. One chair here, one chair here, no talking, no looking. In fact, don't communicate, face your front. That is our understanding of exam, no collaboration. But yet, or rather yet, when these people leave school, if they cannot collaborate, they cannot succeed. So why are we teaching them? Now, you say that, am I encouraging people to, to not, not to work together or to, to go to exam hall and share? The truth is that in the workplace, you will not be required to solve any problem alone. No matter how big the problem is, you will have the opportunity to talk to people. So why not teach our students how to work together to find solutions from school? Why that emphasis on work alone, don't share? In fact, once you give an a lecturer gives an assignment and two people on look alike, you cancels both of them and say you copy yourself, you work together. We are discouraging collaboration. What is our school doing to our people? What, what, what are education systems doing really? Are we training people for the world or trying to take them anti-success? Agility and adaptability, ability to go into a place and you've not seen a problem before or you've never been in a situation before, but you can figure out what to do. Initiative and entrepreneurship, where nobody is telling you what to do, where you just go into a place and you're able to figure out this is the way this thing should work and you're able to navigate your way and go around it. Effective oral and written communication. No matter how smart you are in your mind, if you cannot communicate your ideas to people, you will realize that you're just going to go out there and you... You're just going to be a second class person, so to say. You're sorry to use that word because you can't even, you have fantastic ideas, but you can't sell it. Everybody succeeds by selling something. So if you can't talk, you can't write, which one are you? Communication is a critical skill. Assessing, analyzing information, fantastic requirement for success today. Because once you go on Google right now, you are going to find tons and tons of information. I mean, people, have you noticed that particularly, I mean, I mean you go to a university, this happens a lot in, in university. People come to class and they don't find the lecturer. Maybe there's supposed to be a class at maybe 2 p.m. And they get there and they're asking, ah, is there no class? Meanwhile, right on the door of the class, there's a notice pasted. This class has been rescheduled to 6 p.m. They won't even read it. They're just asking, ah, where is, what, what happened to the class? Where is, where, where is? And so that ability to assess information, you have a problem, you know where to find answers. And when you Google and you find a ton of information, how do you analyze that data to find what you are looking for? Guys, if people don't learn this thing, they can't work outside, they can't succeed. They may look subtle, but these are essential skills. And then seven, curiosity and imagination. That ability to ask questions, is there a better way to do it? How else can this be done? Critical requirement for success. Now, these seven skills are not my idea. I didn't get them. These are, in fact, just go and Google the global achievement gaps. Now, you will see the seven skills. Critical skills for success. But we have a bigger problem. We're like, oh, yeah, a big problem, actually. What's the problem? These subjects are not taught in schools. Then there's no subject called critical thinking. No subject is called problem solving. No subject is called collaboration. Our schools are heavily subject focused. So we teach maths, we teach integrated science, we teach physics, we teach chemistry. And the, and the, and the entire activity revolves around those subjects. Meanwhile, these subjects are supposed to be a means to an end. You should, learning physics should be a means to learning problem solving, to learning critical thinking. So when our when these subjects, when our educational systems shift focus from seeing subject as a means to generating results to where it becomes the focus of the result itself, that's where we have problem. So people come out and say, yeah, I had A1 in physics. I had A1 in, and why you meet people? It's like, where is the A1 in physics? Somebody studied physics, but doesn't understand how electricity moves. 
Does not understand how. So we have a small problem here. Wire needs to move. And you, you studied physics. You did all the Ohm's law, the Newton's law, the Pascal. All the laws are there. Excuse me. How do we get energy from here to here? Or something is happening. Maybe there's a vibration of sound somewhere. We're saying, why is there an echo? Your physics does not explain to you how echoes are formed. You can't tell us that, oh, it's because of this or this or this. You really cannot apply what you studied. And that tells you why people go out and after they have finished learning or finished being educated, they now come and start learning the real skills for life. And it's unfortunate. I feel that we have wasted years of their life. If they knew that photography is what they want to do, why go and spend four years studying anatomy before you come and start learning photography? Who could go and start learning photography when you are 16? But now this is the problem. Our schools generated this problem. So this actually is what gave rise and realized, look, we need a new paradigm of education. And that's where STEM became a big deal because STEM here became, how do we ensure that in the process of teaching all our subjects, we're able to help students develop these core skills that they need. It's this realization that made STEM become a big deal. And so that's actually, I, I said all this story to get to the point of explaining STEM. Though the word STEM itself, in some places they call it STEM. So they have added E, um, science there. But STEM itself is what? Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. It's a core of these four subjects put together. Like I said, some people have added STEM. So between engineering and mathematics, they've added arts. Some have made it steam R. So they've added science, technology, engineering, arts, mathematics, and robotics. They keep adding those things because the whole idea is not the subject. The subject is not the focus. Science is not the focus. Technology is not the focus. Someone said they've added medicine too. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. So engineering, math, they are not the focus. These subjects are actually meant to be a means to an end. So STEM education, like I said, goes beyond the four subjects. It's a paradigm of education that focuses on developing the skill sets that governs the way we think and behave. So when we merge science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, STEM education helps us to solve the challenges that the world faces today. The truth is that at the center of innovation, at the center of development, you will always trace its origin back to one of the STEM fields. Because science, technology, engineering, maths, whether it's in food production, whether it's in medicine and health, whether it's in military and defense, in war, all of those fields have their background in STEM. If there's no technology and engineering, you cannot make guns, you cannot make bombs, you cannot make uh, fighter jets. If there's no science and engineering and uh, this thing, you can't make vaccines, you can't make... So all of those things still find come their comeback. So when a nation does not even understand STEM education, and does not focus on prioritize STEM education, guaranteed that nation is going to be a backward nation. Countries have set up STEM committees, STEM um, this, um, commissions. How do we implement this core in our education system? And if a few countries are doing fine about it, of course, even in those countries, it's still a challenge. The truth is, no country as of today has figured this thing out. Everybody is trying to get it figured out. My problem is that some countries have never joined the conversation. We are not in the WhatsApp group yet. We're still just, okay, we just say STEM is something for some experts. So, but the whole idea is this is a paradigm of learning. And this paradigm of learning, it just gives people the skills that makes them more employable and ready to meet the current labor market. And why is that? Each STEM component brings a valuable contribution to a well-rounded education. And I'm going to explain what that means to you now. Science brings something. There's, there's, like I said, this subject are a means to an end. How do we learn these skills using these subjects? So what does science do? Science gives learners an in-depth understanding of the world around us. It helps them become, excuse me, better at research and critical thinking. So the goal of science is not to mix titration, acid and base, give it blue color, turn little paper to blue, little paper to red, and all of those things. It's actually supposed to help students understand how does the world work? so that they can actually begin to get, ask questions. For example, a very simple science experiment we do in primary school. Get two eggs, put them in two cups of water. Naturally, the eggs will sink. Add salt to one of the cups of water and the egg floats. That entire activity is meant to generate curiosity. Really, what makes salt? Why does salt make an egg float in water? That process of getting curious is the goal of science. Not to learn and say that, okay, 
uh, salt water makes egg to float, and that child crams it, expecting that uh, one day in the exam question, they will ask them, in which of this kind of water will egg uh, float? Natural water, salt water, sugar water, pepper water. And the child is memorizing, so that I just say, no, 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 no. That's that you have wasted the whole goal of science. If the entire goal of science is to drive memorization, the goal is to help students ask questions, curiosity. Why is this thing the way it is? That is the reason for laboratories. Laboratories are actually meant to give students an opportunity to test their curiosity. So when a child is thinking, or a student is thinking, um, so if I join this and this, will it work? What will be the outcome of this? That student should be able to go to a lab. And in that lab, he can test it out. Okay, let me join in a safe place. So laboratories are actually meant to be safe places to do dangerous things. That is why you see that child there wearing goggles because that chemical she's holding could explode. So if there's at least let her be safe. That's the whole idea. So when you miss science, I want to say scientific method is used in the study of science to think. So think chemistry, biology, environmental science, all of those things, they are actually meant to just develop curiosity. So we don't have um, tomatoes are getting bad. We harvest tomatoes and they get bad. And when they get bad, the season that there are no tomatoes, we don't have tomatoes. What do we do? How do we stop tomatoes from getting bad? That is a question you've asked. Students should actually go out there to experiment and find out how to do things. When you don't understand the purpose of science in STEM, you think that it's actually about science as a subject. So once you teach, and you say, me, I don't teach, I'm not a science teacher. I only teach literature. So I don't have anything to do with STEM. No, 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 no. In your literature, in your social studies, you can bring in the scientific method. That's why it's not just the science as a subject, it's science as a method, a method of driving understanding and driving curiosity. Science can be implemented in any subject you teach because STEM cuts across all disciplines. That's the whole idea of this webinar. That's why I say it's um, demystifying the whole STEM thing. So that's what science does. So remember the core, the seven skills, one of them was what? Curiosity and imagination, critical thinking. See the guy that does the job here. When you integrate sciences into your subject, into your education system, or into your teaching methodology, or the scientific process, you help them develop critical thinking, research, and curiosity. Next is what? Technology. Technology prepares young people to work in an environment full of high-tech innovations. So tech is, um, somebody says, when you think of STEM, think of coding. Coding is simply the tech parts of STEM. And like I always tell people, yes, I teach coding, I write coding books. I mean, I'm a, I'm, I'm a coding person, but coding is only a means to an end. When coding is not taught with the full understanding of STEM, you teach coding as a subject. You think that coding is just, okay, we're doing a subject, so let's teach coding. But when you understand that coding is a means to an end, in the process of coding, you are teaching problem solving. So when you give students a project, say, okay, guys, we want to build a game, a simple game where two players are running and a ball is disappearing. And as they are trying to catch, whoever catches the ball wins the game. What you have done is that you have put those students' mind in motion. Oh, two players are running. What does, how does that, how do we make players run? I mean, you've, you've suddenly brought in a lot of things into the game. A lot of things that happen in their mind. If as a coding teacher, you think the goal is to get them to write the correct code to solve the problem, build the game and say, hey, somebody, and then you assess them who did it right, who didn't do it right. You have, you have actually missed the whole picture. So technologies, while they are learning these skills and then people go out there and they don't even understand, the world is tech driven. The other day, I, I, I think I, I was, I, I listened to a governor, one of the governors in Nigeria, very, I think the, the Lagos State governor, let me be very straight about it. He was complaining. Capital flights, people are going abroad for medical treatments. There are a lot of tests, medical tests, you cannot do in Nigeria today because there's nowhere you can do them. So people have some level of sicknesses and they have to fly out of the country to go and do those tests. And the governor said he actually went to invite investors in medical, medical companies. Can you bring those labs to Nigeria? We have market for you. 217 million people live in this country. If you bring that lab to Nigeria, you will blow, you will clean out money. And guess they are complaining. The new machines they are using for tests, for those tests, according to them, they can't find workers who can operate those machines. Because those machines have gone beyond. Well, meanwhile, we have a course in university called Science and Laboratory Technology. Or, I mean, people are doing SLT, SLT. They are graduating. 
Yet the machines that are used today, they can't operate them. That's because technology has been missing in all of those things. I mean, laser focused machines, AI driven machines, doctors today, most of their machines are now becoming computerized. The doctor that does not even understand how the computerization works. Sometimes you have to communicate those machines with code. The other day on a similar webinar like this, a lady was talking, telling us her story, how a doctor, she went for an interview in the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, medical doctor, public health job, got to the last stage of the interview. And they asked her, the, I mean, she had met all the medical requirements. The last question was, do you code in Python? And she was like, Python can. This is a medical job. They say, excuse me, this the requirement of this job is that you must code in Python because you're going to be interacting with data scientists and lots of data. If you can't use, if you can't write Python code, you can't, do it. and that's how she lost the job. A medical job now requires coding in Python. That is why technology is now a requirement. Every student needs to learn it. We're advocating that things like coding should be put in schools. Every school should teach those subjects. Like a so, I mean, so while they learn the skill, they also benefit from the process of learning the skill. Learning to code actually helps them become, I mean, communication, collaboration, teamwork. Those are things students learn when they are learning to code. Because, okay, three of you work on this project together. Now you finish it and we tell them, come and exhibit. Tell us about your, pro your program. And that child stands in front of the class and says, yeah, so this, I built a game, this game, there are bullets flying in the air. What that child is learning is how to pitch. In a few years' time, that child may be a CEO and may have to go and preach to investors. He has never learned how to pitch in class. But you see, there's no subject called pitching. But in the process of learning technology, they learn that. Now, third, engineering. Engineering allows students to enhance problem-solving skills and apply knowledge in new projects. So you have, the goal is, I mean, look at what these kids are doing. They are building something. And like I always say, creativity is scalable. I'm on, sitting on a table right now. If a child can build a bridge across this table with plastic blocks or Lego blocks, that same child can build a bridge across the Atlantic Ocean tomorrow. It is the same level of thinking. The only difference are the size of the parts. If you can build a bridge with plastic blocks, you can build a bridge with, with, with cement blocks. So the engineering process actually gives builds confidence. And there's something called creative confidence. People don't know how to. People, they can do things, but they have never even tried it before. That's why, let me, let me bust our tires more. We have three refineries in Nigeria. All of them have chemical engineers, petroleum engineers, mechanical engineers, all engineers employed there, yet we are not able to drill or rather to, to, to refine petrol. I know you will say there's corruption, there's sabotage. Excuse me, many of these guys are not even sure that those, they know how to operate those machines, yet they have degrees in those courses. It's not just a, the petroleum sector. We have steel companies that don't work. We have, I mean, a lot of things that just don't work. And it is because that problem solving skill that allows you to tinker around, keep trying till it works. And the whole idea is sometimes too, when we miss this part of STEM, when we bring robotics to class, robotics is actually meant to enhance engineering skills. And the engineering skills here is problem solving. So tell them, build this. The mistake that I see teachers making is you now start telling them, so join this block to that block. You go back to the same method, giving instructions. The idea is not to give instructions. It is to get, let them figure it out. That's what engineering does in STEM. Let them figure these things out. And you will agree with me that this is beyond, it's even beyond just sciences. You can integrate the engineering process to practically any subject. Even painting, even fine art, even, I mean, a lot, you can just bring that process once you understand the process. And I'm going to share three things at the end of this that I actually, how can teachers implement STEM across subjects, across curriculum? I'm going to share that. So don't be worried and say, how do I put this in my class? I'm going to give you those, those tools of what to do. But that's the whole idea of engineering. And then mathematics. What does mathematics do? Mathematics enables people to analyze information, eliminate errors, and make conscious decisions when designing solutions. You see, a lot of people are just scared of maths because all that they have learned in maths is numbers and multiplication. Yes, you know the times table. A child can stay here and memorize seven times table, seven times one, seven, seven times two, 14, seven times three, 21. And, and you know, they go on and on and on and on. When there's a real life application of mathematics, they are lost. When you simply ask a child, if Kano is four times the size of Lagos and Abuja is twice the size of, of, of Kano, and Lagos is 200 people. How many, what's the size of Abuja? You have thrown them off balance. Yet, it is just multiplication and division. 
but how to apply it to the real world they have lost that is because we teach math as a subject we don't see math as a tool for teaching analyzing skills for teaching um design for teaching decision making skills when you understand those things you know that one over five is not this is just not one over five you can actually apply it to real things and there's something called word problems in math those problems are not we're not they're not meant to be answer driven we just think okay what problem find the answer the answer is not the solution the process is the education how do you find the answer can you see a problem and convert it to your mathematics that you know yes you know maths yes you know multiplication you know division but now this is a problem Break, translate this problem into that same math skill that you have now wahala don't enter that is the purpose of maths in stem the real education is in the process, not in the final answer. So these are the contributions that each of the four areas, and then art is there, robotics is there. I've talked about robotics, how robotics is part of the engineering process, help them to develop tinkering skills, experimentation skills, trying things out, all of that. It's, I mean, when you implement these things into your education system, you just realize that we're just producing smart students. It's impossible for a student to go through education that is STEM infused, and come out of school and say you cannot find a job. It's not possible. Because that child will, that student will sit down and will just see things to do, figure things out. You will always find a way around. So when somebody says, I'm a graduate, I've been at home three years, four years, I can't find a job. I know, okay, there's a problem. Now, let's come to practice. I don't want to skip you for too long tonight. How do we implement STEM in schools? And I'm going to share three things with you. One is inquiry-based learning. Two, project-based learning. And three, problem-based learning. These three elements of learning can be applied into any subject. These are ways to implement the STEM method to the scientific process, the engineering process, the mathematical process, the science. I mean, all of those things, you can implement them in your classroom, irrespective of what subject you teach, irrespective of what age of students you teach, whether you teach in kindergarten, in grade school, in high school, in university, you can actually implement these things. Now, let's go dive deep. What's inquiry-based learning? Inquiry-based learning is a learning process that engages students by making real-world connections through exploration and high-level questioning. This is the point, inquiry-based. The entire learning is based on questions. The goal of this process is not to find the right answer, but to help students develop the right framework for thinking. Remember I said the first problem is students don't think. Not even students, people don't think. We we have we just come out of school with memorization and we just, you give somebody a problem and say, solve this and guess what I'll tell you? Ah, they didn't teach us this one. Because all that that person knows is memorized answers. The one that they have not taught you, you don't have it. Because that thinking process was not developed. Inquiry-based learning is where a teacher comes to class and says, you know what? There's a problem. And I mean, look at, look at this cycle here, the inquiry process. It starts with questions at the top here. So ask questions. And then let students investigate, allow them. So why does, um, I'm just thinking of, of a good problem, go back to, our, okay. So why does it rain? How do, where does, where does the rain come from? When rain falls, where does it come from? You will hear a manner of answers. You know, the mistake that we make is we come to class and we teach water cycle. So today's topic is what? Water cycle. So water is gas, it is vapor, it is this. So it goes up, it comes down, it goes. You have transferred knowledge. These students have not used their brain. They've only memorized. But if you start by asking, where does rain come from? And let them answer. You'll be amazed. What you have done is that you have set their mind in motion. You have put their brains to work. And you know one big questioning, maybe one day we're going to do a webinar, actually the power of using question for, for learning. Questions are a powerful tool for learning. Unfortunately, we think questions are just a way of finding answers. As a teacher, when you ask a question, you're not looking for right answers. That's not your goal. Your goal is set thinking in process. Let them investigate. Now, it's so, okay. So you think this is the answer. You think this is the answer. Okay, let's find out. Now, when you say investigate, you have made available resources for your students where they can actually find answers, whether it's to go online or there are books you brought to class or there's a video you, you are going to play for them. Let them watch the video and figure out where it comes from by themselves. Inquiry-based learning, you're not giving them answers. You are, you are letting them investigate, figure it out. Now, they've probably watched a video, read a book, done some Googling or something. Now, let them process and analyze. So based on what you found out, what do you, where do you think rain comes from? Now, let them come and share their findings. Let every student talk. See what you have done? 
you have you have you are developing multiple skills in one class and what you are teaching has nothing to do with engineering with mathematics is just probably a basic subject water cycle or green or something but in the process of sharing their findings you are teaching them communication skills because each person must talk remember we said on the seven global achievement gaps effective oral and written communication is one critical skill essential for success the share findings now in that reflection and evaluation that's where you, the teacher, can now filter out misconceptions. So this is wrong, wrong finding, wrong finding. You can help them discover that, oh, no, 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 no. This is not what you got. By the time you end the class and you, in fact, by the end of the class, by themselves, they will have figured out that your water cycle drawing. If you start your class by being the one to draw water cycle, all they will do is they'll memorize it. Step one, uh, uh, vaporization. Step two, condensation. Step three, rain. And then they draw it around. And all that they are waiting for is, let them bring it in exam. Let them bring it in exam. When the exam comes, they draw it for you. And when it's exam time, guess what they are doing? They are memorizing uh, water cycle. They are closing the book to cram. Step one, this. Step two, that. Step three. And they are confused. But if you let them investigate and find the answers, it's impossible for them to forget it. In fact, they can teach it. Because what happened here? At the sharing findings, they did the investigation. They found answers. And then they shared their answers by themselves. The day anybody asked them that question, that child can be a teacher can teach you that subject because you help them figure it out. Remember I say here, the goal of the inquiry-based learning process is not to find the right answer, but to help students develop the right framework for thinking. Let me give you a trick or let me give you, if you're a teacher, the next time you ask a question in class, two things that I would advise you not to do. Number one, when you ask a question, the likely thing that's going to happen is smart students will shoot their hands up. I mean, me, 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 me. Once you call somebody to answer that question, you know what you have done? You have shut down everybody's thinking process. So when you actually ask a question, give them time to think. Ask a question and pause. Let them be raising their hands and say, don't worry. What has happened? If you have not called anybody, even those who have not raised their hands, their brains are working, they're thinking, what could be the answer to this question? What could be the answer? Once you call somebody, they stop thinking. This is the, that is the process. The other just stop thinking, okay, they found the answer, so let's move to the next question. And then when you recall somebody eventually, whether the answer is right or wrong, hold your feedback first. So you say, um, what, is the, how, what, is, what, is the, what is a lunar eclipse, for example? And someone says me, and he explains, hey, lunar eclipse, when the sun stands behind the moon, the moon stands behind the sun, and we cannot see it. Your next answer, your response should not be, whether the answer is right or wrong. You want to know, why did they say so? Where is that thinking coming from? If the answer is right, ask why. If the answer is wrong, still ask why. Your goal is that you want to find out where the misconception is coming from. Because once you find where it's coming from, if you can help them through the thinking process, you will be amazed that even other students are going to be learning from the conversation that you are having. So ask a question and let people answer. Wrong answer. So why do you think so? I think it is this because this, this, this. Okay, who else agrees with him? This person, you've turned your class into a conversation room. That's like a board meeting. That's like a scientific laboratory already. It's opposed. Imagine the difference is teacher comes to class, says today's topic, just write on the board, write on the board, copy the note. Are you done copying? Okay, tomorrow we have test. I mean, just look at the difference in learning. That's inquiry-based learning. Step two, another way to implement STEM in your classroom, project-based learning. Project-based learning. Uh, this is an instructional approach designed to give students the opportunity to develop knowledge and skills through engaging projects set around challenges and problems they may face in the real world. Now, project-based learning is where you start with the projects. And in the course of the projects, they are learning what they need to be able to execute that project. Let me give you a good example. You come to class and say, today, we want to make a table. I've split them into groups and say, today, every class, we are going to make a table. Now, this may be a woodwork class, maybe a science, a technology class or something, but you want them to make tables. Guess where they're going to start from? So what do we need to make tables? The first answer they're going to start telling, oh, we need to make, we need wood. What types of wood? The wood for the surface and the wood for the leg are not the same. In that process, they are learning the different types of wood. What are they trying to do to make table? 
But to make table, they need wood. To make to use wood, they now have to learn the different types of wood. Now, what do we use to cut wood? Tools. What are the tools? We need saw, we need caliper, we need smoothener, veneer, caliper, all of those things. In the process of making table, you are teaching them tools. And as they are learning the tools, they are immediately knowing how to apply the tools, what to do with those tools. It's a different ball game if you come to and say, okay, so types of wood, uh, plywood, uh, solid wood, timber wood, and you give them list of wood. What do you end up with? Memorizing types of wood. Now, tools for woodworking, saw, hammer, this, and they memorize them. Project-based learning, as they are knowing what a saw is, they are knowing what to do with saw, and they are trying it out. As they are learning what a hammer is, they are knowing what to do with hammer. Types of nails, they are learning types of nails. At the end of the day, yes, a table is made, but the learning that happened in the process of making that table is permanent. Those students cannot forget it. And now they can apply that same knowledge to make something else. When you say make a cupboard, they're not saying they didn't teach us. They just know that, oh, cupboard is another type of, um, so they, they just figure it out. And somebody is, let's name that person, sorry. Okay, so that's what project is then. In, in project based learning, students are driven to learn because they have seen the need to learn and they have an immediate application for the knowledge. And this thing can be applied in any subject. Give them a project related to that subject. It could be, a project could be as simple as, let's go to the market. Going to the market can be a project. So what do we need? We want to, we want to cook food. What do we need to cook? Ingredients, this. I mean, it could be, let's go shop. It could be anything you can have. Just as a teacher, that's why you are a teacher. You are a creative person. Think in your own space, in your own subject that you teach. What project can I actually give my students that is going to help them to be able to apply the things that way to learn the things they need to learn and apply those things to the subjects immediately? That is project-based learning. And then the third one, okay, so these are the phases of project-based learning. Project planning, project launch, implementation, project conclusion, project debrief. Because this have to start by planning. I mean, I'm going to have to skip this. I'm trying to run for time this evening um, so that if there are any questions, I can actually take questions. But this is the process of project-based learning. And each of these actually help them develop skills. So when they are planning, they sit down. Okay, we need a table measurement. They are measuring table. Mathematics is coming in. They're understanding the entire... I mean, they can, project based learning allows them to apply interdisciplinary knowledge from different spaces. And this is what happens at the background of project based learning. See what they are learning. They are learning <laughs> public presentation, reflection or revision and, and revision. So you've done something, you ask yourself, so did you do it right? In depth inquiry and innovation, 21st century skills. Voice and choice by students. So we want to know, we'll paint our own table yellow. This one paint our own blue. Why blue? Why yellow? You'll be amazed that they have a meaning for their blue. They have a meaning for their yellow. Allow them. That is, you are developing confidence. You are developing those skills, driving questions. So something happens, tell them, okay, you want your table to have two drawers. Oh, really? What, what, so what size of a drawer? What do you want to do with the drawer? I mean, in that whole process, you are a lot happens on the background. This is how you implement STEM-based learning in a classroom. And then the last I'm going to talk about for teachers today is problem-based learning. Problem-based learning is a student-centered approach in which students learn about the subject by working in groups to solve an open-ended problem. So look at this, this image here. In traditional learning, you tell students what to do, what, what they need to know. They memorize it. Then you give them a problem and tell them, now, based on what you know, solve this problem. So what they are doing is they, you just, they come to class, their minds have really not worked. So they sit down in class and listen to your lecture. So you give them a list. Uh, this is this, that is that, this is this. Remember it and they remember it. They write it down, they memorize it. Now, let's use this to solve this problem. But look at the flip side. Problem-based learning is where you give them a problem first. Based on the problem, they realize that, oh, there's something we need to know in order to solve this problem, but we don't know it yet. They now go to learn something because there's a problem they want to solve with that knowledge or that skill and then they learn it and then they apply that to solve the problem immediately they are totally two different paradigms this is what we do in schools in africa traditional learning we need to shift to problem-based learning where we actually help our students and when problem-based learning is, is taught what you have done is that that student 
cannot go out of school and tell you they cannot solve problems. Like I said at the beginning, they always tell us every problem is an opportunity in disguise. If problems are opportunities, I am yet to see the continent that has as many problems as we have in Africa. That tells you why Africa is the land of opportunities. I travel out of this country a couple of times and I'm always amazed. When you are going out, the plane is full of blacks. When you are coming back, the whites are coming. Apologies, I mean, this is not supposed to be a, a, a racial list. But the question is, what are these people seeing? As we are jackpying out of our countries, they are rushing in. What are they seeing that we are not seeing? Because there is opportunity here. Wherever there are problems, there are opportunities. In the city where I live, as I drive to work every day, I see problem on every street, problem left, right, and center. Yet, people are telling us that no work, no jobs. It simply tells us that they have not yet learned how to see problems and how to solve problems. How do we help them? Teachers, bring problem-based learning to your classroom, please. Don't let your students leave school and join these statistics. It's going to be an error. They've gone through school and you taught them and then they go out and then they join this list of statistics that, oh, we cannot find work, cannot find work. Please bring problem-based learning. Let them get used to the problem-solving process. Let them get comfortable with problems. Problems are a part of life. If there's no problem, there'll be no work. There's no problem, there'll be no industry. There's no problem, there'll be no jobs. It's problems that generate need, that generate need for people to work. So let's teach them how to solve problems. I think I'm running out of my time already, and I'll have to probably start shutting down here. But now, problem solving, you're asking, what's the difference in problem-based learning and project-based learning? In project-based learning, students actually are required to produce something to demonstrate mastery of the content. Whereas in problem-based learning, students present a solution to a clearly defined authentic problem. So project-based learning, you don't just find the problem, the solution, you do something, you build every project-based learning has to have a, a presentation, an artifact, something that they will present. Sometimes it may be something they build. Sometimes it could just be a model. Sometimes it could just be a, a design. But in project-based learning, help them see and help them be able to make something. Sometimes we just say, okay, so we want to, the goal of this, like this project is create a design for us. And that is why as a teacher, if you're going to bring in STEM, that's where technology comes in now. You're asking yourself, hey, well, how can they create those things when they don't, we don't have a lab? They say, my own school self, there's no lab. We don't have a place where there's woodwork. That's why we have things like 3D modeling. There are technology tools that can allow your students convert their imagination to solutions. Unfortunately, I didn't make a list of those, but I can actually share a few of them. There's a website called Tinkercad. So if you're thinking of a place for, for modeling, um, www.tinkercad.com. I just dropped the link in the, in the chat box there. It allows students to create a 3D model for almost anything they can imagine. That's electrical, whether it is engineering, whether it is building wise, whether it is uh, you, you, uh, on Tinkercad, a student can come there, pick a battery, pick wires, put a bulb, and see if I join this battery to this wire, will this bulb light up? The way it will happen in real life, it allows you to do those things in, on 3D, on a system. So you really, we really don't have excuses. There's another one I'm going to share with you. I think it is, um, I think it's PHA, PHET. I don't, I'm trying to get the exact, I'm going to get the, the, the exact link maybe later on. But it's, it's like a simulation. It's, so you can actually go into that simulation lab. It's a laboratory, virtual laboratory. Pick a bottle of, a bowl of water and put it down. And now pick different items. So how, which item will sink? Pick wood and throw in it. Pick metal, throw in it pick um, stone, throw in it, and see the response to each of these items. All of those tools are there. But basically, in project-based learning, they create something that they can show. In problem-based learning, they solve a problem and come up with a solution. At the end of the day, you've taught them critical thinking and problem solving. You've taught them collaboration because most times they don't work alone. They get to work with others. They get to respect the opinion of others. They get to argue back and forth. I mean, I'm going to play a video for you shortly just to see what an what a class stem driven classroom looks like unfortunately it's not in africa but i mean just so that we can have an idea of what is possible and maybe the last bit i'm just talk to parents briefly too so parents you're asking so this is school 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 how do we help students at home to learn or develop stem skills the simplest of them invite your children to engage in household activities More, a lot of household activities actually involve stem concepts in the kitchen you are cutting onion your child is cutting onion 
there is precision, there is calculation, there is this. I mean, you are, they, are, they are learning things. You are, you are cooking food. Okay, so what country of salt should we put? How many cups of rice? How many cups of this? Don't think that, eh, my children, let them just be on the system all the time, read book, lesson, lesson, lesson. Get them involved. The real life, hands get dirty. As parents, we know that it is when we roll our sleeves that work gets done. Let's not teach our children that all work gets done just on paper or on system. Let them get hands on. Let them wash dishes. Let them mow the lawn. Let them weed grasses. Let them do things, hands on things that actually help students, children to develop this skill. So even at home, you can do project based learning. I mean, I watch many movies and you see these movies, a man is making, is, is repairing his car and the child is there. Get me spanner test seven. And the child is spanner seven. And he goes there, looks at the spanners, look for seven. And the child, okay, help me loosen this tire. Children grow up. They can't even change a car tire. That is STEM. That is STEM problem, STEM. So if you have a flat tire. I hope that the parents themselves know how to change car tire first, first, before we won't say that they should teach children. But don't protect your children from those things. Let them learn those things. So you want to cut down trees in the, in the compound, get them involved. You want to do whatever it is that involves them. You want, sometimes get dirty, get dirty, get tools. Try and make your home a, an experimentation place. Like we say, a laboratory is simply a safe place to do these key things. As parents, let's make our homes a safe place to do risky things. I'm gonna play a video. Um, I'm gonna play a video now. And um, I, I hope that that video actually, um, where is it? Okay, good, I think it's here. Um, just confirm if you can hear my sound. We can hear. My engineering design process, which is a sum of all of my parts and all the professional development that I've been fortunate enough to be involved with, involves students looking at a problem, or it's a problem that they point out themselves, and then they try to devise a solution. How did that data drive your decision? Sometimes we'll go through and we'll give a little background, it just kind of depends on what it is. It's impressed upon the students that their initial design needs to be their honest opinion about how they would remedy a situation. And I'm looking generally for a production of an artifact. And it could be a system that they'll develop or a specific tool that they'll use. Three, two, one. In this case, we developed a rocket to hit a target. Oh. Oh. Please draw your individual design for today. So I had them draw what their rocket would look like, make sure to note details as far as all the variables from mass, the number of fins, the type of fins, the orientation, and then also write a little justification statement of why they chose what they did. At this point, we're transitioning from the individual design to a group design. After their individual design, it's always a collaborative effort. We definitely need to keep Idaho fins if we're going to add mass to it. Because I always try to make sure there's three or four people because with two, you generally don't get enough varied opinions. So three or four is kind of my sweet spot with four being perfect. Make sure everybody gets a chance to speak about their design before we discuss it as a group. First of all, we definitely need a long rocket and a PSI somewhere between 35 and 40. I was going to say, what if we did a little higher angle? Because you know First off, each student takes their turn to talk about their individual design. The expectation is if I'm going to set that time aside for the students to individually share, they need to have something that they can describe. So they need to have plenty of descriptors, they need to have a drawing, so especially when sometimes vocabulary is lacking in some kids. If they have a picture, then they can fully portray to their group what ideas they're going with. And then we can just, just do the yeah, angle we do 40. 35, 40. Yeah. Then what happens is I give them time to come together, whether it's a process of debate. It would add like 30 feet if we added mass to the But we're this. lowering our ankle. Or whether it's compromise. What about the mass? Yeah. The mass, I think we should put it around two. Or three. Yeah, I'm thinking two. They work together to come up with a common group design of which then I sign off on and then they can start construction of their design. All right, here we go. Three, two, one. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, oh, oh. So close. 
during the test we collect data, then we'll come back and analyze the data. If they need to make adaptations because maybe it's at a different point in the process or modifications, they note that and they always provide reasoning for their choices. Since we added the 0.5 grams of mass, it got closer. It added a bit of inertia to the rocket so that way it went a little bit farther than it would have at the same PSI and angle. And then after that, it's a cyclical process. Individual design, group design, build, test, reflect. And then when I look at their packet, which they'll turn in at the end, it will include all these pieces so I can see how their thoughts and how their product has evolved over the course of the lesson. I like this strategy because the students see the practical application of everything I'm teaching. It makes them think, it keeps them involved. As a teacher, it allows me to see physically what they're thinking and allows me to read what they're thinking and justify why they made the changes that they did. All right, so let me come back now. Um, I'm going to probably have to stop there. I think that was my last slide. Yes, I actually plan to stop the lesson there so we can just um, now, but I'm going to do a little debrief. So from that video, you can just drop it in the comment section. What did you see that stood out for you and that you think, man, I think this is something we could be doing different. Just please say something from the video one. And then um, later, I'm going to get questions. But from that video, just what stood out for you that you noticed? What did you notice that is different about that class? And what do you think the outcome of that kind of a class is going to be? Imagine that you had the chance or privilege to grow up in that kind of a setting. What would have been different for you today? You can just drop it in the comment section there. Just comment. I mean, what did you observe? But for this particular teacher we just watched, see the process. That was, um, okay, let me also ask, what kind of learning was that? The learning that was done in that classroom? Was that project-based learning, problem-based learning? Okay, uh, Dr. Buya, please, you can, you can unmute yourself and speak. Um, I think what I saw was the opportunity for the students to take part in the learning process by documenting that process. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we don't do that. We come prepared with a PowerPoint slide and probably some worksheets and have students fill in. But this is a problem-based learning where the teacher acts as a facilitator and allows the students to go through the process of 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 thinking and inquiry and innovation, but then having them actually document that process yeah. and guide them through it. Yeah. So I I think you are right. If you ask me, I think there's inquiry based learning here. There's project based. There's pro it's I mean, that video is STEM based learning, hands on. So people are saying the students will have confidence and have sure for having fun while learning. Yes. That kind of learning builds confidence. You can't go through that process. I mean, you built a rocket. Come on. You can actually go and say, yeah, I, I know how to build a rocket. Collaboration and hands-on learning. Nobody's working alone. Yes, there's a part where you work alone, but they end up coming to work together. Activity-based learning. Students are involved in creating solutions, brainstorming and teamwork, project-based. They're totally engaged. That's the kind of class that is going to go on for two hours, and the child wouldn't know that two hours has gone. The typical normal class, once it's 40 minutes, they're like, uh, sir, time of next lesson. But when you have a class like this, the students are just excited. They just want to stay. They want to learn. And it's, it's engaging. Everybody's involved in learning process. Mistakes are made. And that's, I love that. Mistakes are made. But it does not matter. That's why it's a lab. That's why it's a classroom. Your classroom should be a safe place for mistakes to be made. When we make our classrooms to be precision driven everybody wants to get it right we actually start losing the people start dreading school it becomes a scary place for them collaboration among the students um lots of that inquisitiveness so if even if you are lost somewhere please can, daniel can you help us move your voice i think somebody's in a bus stop somewhere thank you um so you could see building inquisitiveness making them know why something is done so they say okay if you and you see they go and try it out so they assign masses to their rockets they shoot it it does not get to the destination they figure out oh, why didn't it go there is it not heavy enough they come back 
add the mass, make it heavier, go and try again. And he said, it's a cyclical process. I said it earlier, it's not, the goal is not the results. The process is the education, not the right or wrong answer. It's the process. And that is what STEM is trying to bring into education. Um, you know, someone said, I will have learned public speaking skills at their, at their age. Yeah, I mean, if, if you had, because you write, not just public speaking, see writing, each of them is writing documents. So you're observing an experiment. I mean, you're, that's like project management. Those children are going to find themselves in NASA tomorrow where they are launching real rockets. And they're just going to feel, oh, I've spent all my life here already. They feel like they have experience working in a real company. That is what we want to be able to do with our educational systems. And we all have a responsibility, particularly those of us who are educators. This has no, it, you, can, you might say, eh, it has to do with the government. Please, let's leave government out of this matter. Government, with all due respect, we need them. But we are the ones who should be advising governments. We should be telling them, please, this is what I think we need to do. Because the truth is, many of these the people in government don't even know the real problems. That's why they are busy fighting symptoms all over the place. So it's, I, I think that that's, if I have gotten you to understand that irrespective of what you teach, you can actually go back to your class. Starting, schools are resuming in another two weeks or less. You have about two weeks, schools are resuming. Maybe, yeah. You can go back to your class and start thinking, how do I make my class different? Whether you teach coding, I mean, my guys from the STEM Academy are here. We're going to shift our focus from, the goal is not just for our students to learn the code. Yes, they're learning Python. But learning Python, I mean, so if you, my, my book, so I, I wrote this coding textbooks, Early Coding for Kids. I'm not sure if I have some here, okay? I always have them with me here. Um, for those who don't know, so I wrote coding textbooks. And I always like to reference in my book one, the very first page of learning, <laughs> I, I wrote a quote there and it says, first solve the problem, then write the code. Coding is useless if people have not learned to think because coding is not about writing code, it's actually about thinking. So if they have not learned how to solve problems, what code are they writing? In fact, anybody can write code. Any dummy can learn to write Python. It's like speaking English. Anybody can speak English. Python is a language. JavaScript is a language. Our goal is not to teach them the language, it's to teach them the thinking this is i mean that's the whole idea of stem education so i mean if if you've gotten to this point and you understand that and you're feeling i can do it differently it's 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 i mean that's that's the goal of this webinar that i think for me that will have been a major major shock someone says they are learning data analysis happening right there exactly so you are they're taking data they are keeping record a lot is happening in one class in one one class a lot is happening so whatever subject you teach, now I'm going to open the floor. I want two things. I want to take questions, but I also want to take, I want someone who is a teacher and you tell us what subject you teach and you can tell us, okay, what, just tell us something that you think you can do in your class to either implement any of the STEM-based approaches, problem-based, project-based, inquiry-based. You can just unmute yourself and talk. I mean, this is supposed to be an open, I, this was supposed to be 19 minutes, we started 10 minutes, so we have about 13 minutes more to go. And so in 13 minutes, I want to take questions and one or two feedback. You are a teacher where you're thinking, I think there's something I can do differently. I want just one or two ideas so that I just, it's not just me speaking. I'm sure that ideas are flowing through your mind now. Just, you can raise your hand or just unmute yourself and speak. Anybody wants to go? So while you are thinking of that, if before anybody comes up, you have a question, a specific question with regards a subject, with regards whether you are a teacher, you are a school owner, you, um, you are a parent, something you can ask. This is also a time you can ask your questions in any of these areas. What can I do differently? What's just any area that maybe I must have, maybe you came in late and there's something you missed that I didn't touch about, talk about. You can drop the question in the chat box or you can just raise your hand and um, I will just call you to ask your question. Okay, no questions. Okay, we have a question. So yeah, Joy Duro. Just unmute yourself and speak here. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for this lecture. Okay, sir, please. My question is 
at this point, we understand that the teaching method actually helps to improve our results or the, the effectiveness of our lessons. So my, so my question is, in a class where you want to give the very best, and you find out that the children probably in your class are not really flowing with the particular method you've used, what can be the help you could render? Like we know that children are different either by any of these learning techniques we've seen so far. So if we have about 20 of them, mm -hmm. okay, I think she's gone off, but I think I got her question. Um, I think I got your question. So you-, you I probably only five can flow. Uh, okay, you're still talking. Okay, all right. So I think I got your question. So you are saying you're, you're implementing a particular method of teaching, but it's not working for everybody. Fantastic. I mean, I'll be surprised if it works for everybody. So in this particular classroom, this um, method was working for, the, the, the project was everybody together. But there's something called differentiation in education. So differentiation is where you discover that you have different kinds of students, and then you design different learning pathways for each student. Uh, there's also something they call, is it IDP or ILP, Individualized Learning Plan or something, but even that's, that's not even good at far. Differentiation is where you give students projects. If you're doing project-based learning, you can have different projects in the same class. Just give students the kind of project that you feel they are connected with or that they will enjoy or that they are going to find meaning doing. So um, your class will have different projects. If I was an engineering guy like this guy, one class could be building, one set could be building rockets, another one could be building a solar panel, another one could be building a wind turbine, different projects. All I will do is I'll just need to study my class and say, okay, I understand the different sets of people in this class and then give them different things that connect with them. But ultimately, that is why you are the teacher. Nothing is cast in stone. Just keep on experimenting. If it does not work, try it out. Your class is an experiment, it's a lab. That's the whole idea. If it's a lab for the students, there can be a lab for you, the teacher too. Keep on trying, keep on trying. The goal is just keep them engaged, keep them excited, keep them learning, keep them growing, keep them, just make the learning process fun and be sure that you are helping them develop, excuse me, those core skills while the learning is going on. There's a hand up there, goodness F Young is there too. Um, I don't know if I if I helped you. I mean, you can just go try it out, Joy, and see. Goodness, F. Young. And then I'm going to take the questions in the chat. So, goodness, you can you can speak. Goodness, you can unmute yourself and speak. We are muted if you are speaking. We can't hear you. Okay. While goodness is trying to unmute, um, my question is: as a teacher, um. What can I do to enhance my own critical thinking ability so that I can transfer same to the children? Interesting. Um, what can I do to enhance my own critical thinking ability? The only way to learn how to think is actually by thinking. That is why we are bringing these things to class so that when our students have spent their growing up years and they are used problem solving and critical thinking, it becomes a part of them. So I think as a teacher, one thing you could do is um, personal development, get exposed to more training, get exposed to more trainings that actually expose you to things like that. I mean, after listening to this webinar as a teacher, most likely you've learned one or two new things. That's growth, that's progress, that's something. So expose yourself more to problem solving, critical thinking. And amazingly, you'll be amazed that even as a teacher, with your students' project-based learning, you yourself can be learning a lot. And that's the thing. Sometimes you don't have to have all the answers as a teacher. Give them the problem and then study with them. All of you together with them, be learning the thing together and be going together. You'll be amazed that even as a teacher, you will learn from the process. Okay? So, um, goodness, are you there now? If goodness is not there, okay. Emily, you can speak. Your hands are up. 
Yeah, I just want to encourage all the teachers here on the call. Uh, yeah. We are now living in a technological world. The kids have a lot more advancement in technology than we are. Yeah. Um, you only need to be a few steps ahead of them. Like myself, I'm learning coding and um, robotics right now. I don't know much, but whatever, I know how to structure a class and I know how to manage students. My goal as a teacher is to be a facilitator. So I'm not worried about knowing the, the problem with the education system is we always put teachers at the front of the classroom with all the power. It's different now. The kids have a lot more power because they have everything accessible to them. Everything, they can have it on online. They have chat GPT. They have all these available technologies. So we really cannot be the owners of the knowledge. We are only the facilitators. So our job is to learn how to facilitate that knowledge acquisition. And you, you can be wrong in front of the students. Please allow yourself to not know the answer. Allow yourself to let the students see you finding the solutions and work with it with them together because that's how you help them become critical thinkers and innovators. By saying that, I don't know the answers, but I empower you to be able to know how to arrive at the solutions. Let's do it together. Mm. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you so much. I mean, I, I, I love that perspective. And I think I, I mentioned that in the past, and I think you just amplified it when I said, even as a teacher, you can actually learn that you are learning. The truth is, you don't have to be right. I love the way you it. Allow yourself to be wrong. Once your class has become a safe place, for learning. In fact, let your students be free to challenge your thinking. That's when you know that your class is, is, a, is a safe place. As a teacher, you don't need to question it. You don't need to you, ah, sorry, I don't think that is right. I don't think that's the only way. I don't think that there's, I think there's a better way. And she said, many of these kids come with a lot of technological advancement. I mean, that's a fantastic contribution. Thank you. Let me not repeat everything you've said. Thank you so much, Emily. That was really, really fantastic. And I love the fact, so Emily is a chemistry professor. She's learning to code. I mean, you, you see that combination? That's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, Good evening, uh, sir. Uh, is that from Olola? Well, that's goodness now. Goodness, okay, goodness now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Goodness. Go ahead. This webinar. It's been exciting and interesting. So, a quick one. My question is: of all of this uh, base learning you've mentioned, situation. Imagine a situation in your class where you have so many things to deal with, so many subjects to deal with in a day. So, how do you tend to uh, achieve these learning um, strategies that? You just mentioned how do you tend to do all of this with the, the time frame given to you you know that you need to meet all of the subjects that you have per day thank that's, you that's a very fantastic question especially for those who teach where one teacher is responsible for all the subjects fantastic question real problem here but you see now there's some there's a concept i'm going to tell you about and i'm, I'm going to let you all do some extra reading about this called integrated curriculum integrated curriculum or integrated learning where one learning activity actually integrates elements of different subjects you see one of the other problems that we have is that that's loyalty to timetable we must do maths for 40 minutes then go to science for 40 minutes then go to art for 40 minutes then go to music then go to this phe while it is actually possible to design a learning activity that may take an hour and a half, maybe 90 minutes, but integrates an element of three different subjects. When we need to take off those um, guardrails, that's very strict. This is how it must be done. If you're not doing like this, it is wrong. Now, and I'm excited that there are a few school owners here. I'm, I'm happy that there are a few school owners in this place who are actually hearing these things. And what you need to do is you need to give your teachers the liberty to design their classroom. As once you are sure that they know what to do, they are armed with the right skills, they are armed with the right knowledge and the right expertise, let them design their classroom. You know, you can learn, you can teach music and coding together because in that thing called Scratch, there's an entire extension called music and they can design music, can write notes of music while learning to code. One activity, you can teach arts and coding. You can, I mean, you can integrate things together in that, in one subject, maybe 
maybe one day we should do a semi webinar on integrated integrated learning and curriculum so that you actually see there's a process to it there's a process for connecting different subjects something called concept maps i mean if you actually bring concept map what's the concept i want them to learn in this subject what's the concept i want them to learn in this subject now how do i bring it together through a project one project that in the course of doing that project they learn all those concepts they have learned three subjects it may not be in time table that this was mass class this was it was just a project class look at the video we watched in that same class you can count how many subjects were happening there there was maths there was physics there was um i mean a lot of things were happening in one class so in that situation where you have to teach many subjects i think what you need to start first do is disconnect yourself to that bondage of timetable lawyer i mean that you must do eight subjects a day you can do three subjects a day but authentic learning has taken place that should be the goal real learning is what should happen not ticking of timetable that yes i signed we've done this we've done this agric you can do a lot of things in one so yes that's that was a good question um i'm still going to come back to the comments but i think they are still there's still a hand up uh okay so let's take the last two hands omolola and then friday deja vu then i'm going to read the comments and see if there are questions Emily say yes, integrated learning webinar will really help operationalize STEM learning. So yeah, I think we're going to, we have another webinar in two weeks. Um, that one is on developing grids, helping students develop grids. It's in two weeks time. I'll probably share the link. I mean, as I'm saying, I'm going to send an email with the, my office will send an email with the link to this recording and probably put the, the link the link for the next webinar in two weeks. How do you help your students develop grids? Grid is critical element for success in today's world. How do you build grids? In students going up early we're going to schedule integrated learning so yes omolola you are next okay good evening sir thank you for this uh, webinar okay so i want you to uh, help me to strike a balance looking at the educational system in nigeria you know I, i'm a teacher i love i love to do hands on a lot with the children but at times when i look at the way we set our questions the children just need to cramp to answer their exam questions. So I don't know how we can strike a balance between uh, what you've taught us this evening with the different learning methods. So how do we strike a balance with children knowing what to do with their hands and passing an exam? Looking at the Nigerian system. The whole idea of this seminar is that we need to kill that thing called Nigerian system. We need to, the system is where, that system that has not brought us to where we are now is what we need to change because we've run that system for decades where has it who that system f so we need to get to the point okay so in our stem academy we teach coding in schools and a few of my team members who are here they know that one of the areas where we fight a lot in the office is on setting questions assessments when it comes to assessments and we we kill with before exams assessment are given we bring the questions and we together put it on the screen and we say no 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 this question is not this question does not test for learning this question just tests for remembrance there's something called the bloom's taxonomy if you are if you are in education you know those things the levels of learning at the bottom is remembering and at the top level is creating creating is the highest form of learning i think i should probably I, I, i'm going to pull up that slide later on and probably just show you that blooms taxonomy of learning the seven i think it's there are seven of them yes okay good i think i found it i think i found it and i, I want to i want to share i want to share that just to to come to help you answer that question very well um apologies that we are going beyond time but i'm, I'm i hope that it's been helpful so can you see uh -oh. so can you see my screen Yes, we can. Good. So this is, it's called the Bloom's taxonomy. These are the levels of learning. There are seven of them. At the bottom of learning is remembering. Remembering facts is the lowest form of learning. Look at it here. Recall facts and basic concepts. Learning improves as it goes higher above the ladder. So after remembering, what you need to seek is understand. Beyond remembering, let them to understand. But understanding a lot is not, does not show that learning has fully taken place. Applying is higher than learning. Analyzing, evaluating. But look at, I love this. At the highest form of learning is creating. So until a student can create something with the knowledge he has learned or he has gained, learning is incomplete. You will, you will agree with me that a lot of our exams, now under this line here, this bottom line of bit of the slide, you see some words. When your exam questions start with these words, you know the level that your questions are. 
if you are setting an exam and you're going to define this, list this, state this, uh, repeat this, know that your entire exam is just testing for remembrance. You need to change the kind of questions you set. These are the kind of words that start questions at each of the level. If you're asking when I say, okay, design something, um, develop something, I mean, create something, build something, that's where you are testing at the creation level. So one of the goals that you should have as a teacher is your questioning, your assessment should actually seek to go above, to take students higher on that Bloom's taxonomy of learning. Nobody says you must set questions in a particular way, Omolola. You can change the way questions are set. That's why you are the CEO of that class. As the teacher of that class, you are the, you are, you, you are the CEO. So a, an assessment could be a conversation. You could bring a child and just have a conversation. And in that conversation, you have finished, you have finished the exam. There's no law that says exam has to be written. I don't know which law that is. There's no, I mean, that's, we've done that for decades. Where has it taken us to? We have to have the courage to change some things. That is only when we're going to get different results. They said insanity is doing the same thing the same way and expecting a different result. We are not insane. We are sane people. That's how we're having this conversation. So feel free to tweak the system. Okay. Fantastic. I hope I answered that. And I'm, I mean, if you, if you are in a school where the school management is not giving you that flexibility, I know this is really going to be difficult. You now need to have, find a way to educate the owner of the school or your proprietor or proprietress to help you. But I mean, um, Olola, I know where you work, so I know that that's not a problem for you. So just go on. You are free. Go on, go on, go on, go on, innovate. Change your, the way you set your exams. And I know that things are going to work for you. Yes, uh, let me go up the chat now. Okay, there was one more hand I forgot. Friday, Deja Vu. Friday, your hand was up. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. My hand was up. Good evening, sir. Yeah. Uh, but you answered the question. Ironically, you just answered the question. My question was actually, if you are in a system that has a very stringent um, um, traditional base learning, where applying these things, you are going against their, their rule. How, what do you do? But you just, you just answered that in your last comment. Okay. Okay, I hope I helped anyway. I hope they help. So sometimes it might be, I'm not going to say leave the system because you might be the only hope that the children in that system have. So if it's possible to change the system while there, maybe you are, maybe that is your ministry to that system. Those children, maybe that's why God put you in that school to help them and help educate. Um, now, this is where other skills come in, leadership skills. There's a book um, by John Maxwell, 360 Degree Leadership how you can lead across the line, how you can lead above you. You are a teacher, you have a boss. How can you lead your boss? How can you influence your boss to make decisions? So if you are in a system and you're having difficulty leading your boss, getting your boss to do something, I recommend 360 Degree Leadership by John C. Maxwell. That book is going to help you know how you can lead those below you, those at your level and those above you. So just, um, but if, at, if you get to the point and you have to lead the system well, I'm not going to say much, but um, someone says, um, I'm a coding instructor. I really learned a lot during the session. I will increase the late rate of project-based learning by including some robotics projects in my classes. Fantastic. That's the whole idea of this. Um, someone asked, someone says, okay, thank you for this session. I'm a STEM educator, and I believe I can apply one of these methods for my physics lessons. Fantastic, Pascal. Just go out there. I mean, physics is full of, of project-based learning. I mean, with physics, let me tell you one that I saw the other day, and I was so excited. This teacher got a bowl a plastic bucket, like a plastic bowl, four corner bowl, and put metal objects inside the bowl, right? Small objects, pins, spanners, nuts, screwdriver, just little things. And gave, this is like five, six year olds, and gave them magnets in groups. So each bowl of water has four students and say, use, how can you remove these items inside the water, these metal items in the water without touching the water? All you have is a magnet. What can you do? I mean, problem solving. So you saw them thinking, hmm, we can't touch the water. We can't put our hand in the water. How do we use magnets to pull out these items? It's not pulling from the top. What do we do? Very simple activity, but you are getting students to think. And not just go there and ask them, so why, what are you doing? What do you think? So yeah, physics, you have a lot of, of things to do there in physics. Uh, Akin Sola Mojibade says, I really want to appreciate you for this wonderful opportunity. It's really an eye opener for me as a school owner. I guess I've mistaken coding for STEM. A lot of people do actually. Many people do that. And I truly appreciate your way of clarifying this. So my major challenge is getting one around me here in Kaduna. Because to be sincere, my interest has really grown for it to happen in my school. This session and help to link um, with a resource person here in the North will really bring my dream to reality. Thanks. 
Hmm. Okay, so I think my people are hearing this. So we have a STEM Academy, um, used to be called STEM Academy in Nigeria, it's now called Early Founders Labs. And what we do is we actually help schools implement STEM. We teach coding, but beyond coding, we just basically bring STEM business into schools. To be honest, we are not yet in the North in Kaduna, but um, Daniel and David, so maybe you could, uh, if you register for the webinar, we're going to check out your name and we're going to reach out to you and find out um, what our team can do to help, maybe resources. So we have resources, we have books that actually teach coding across five levels, level one, two, three, four, five. We have um, teacher training courses that actually help us coach teachers who can teach those courses for you. So if you have teachers who are maybe good at ICT, you want to train, we can actually help coach them, train them, and then work with them to implement coding in your school. That's one of the options. But yeah, let's talk and then we can see what's possible. Please, what's the name of the YouTube channel where the session is streamed? It's actually streamed on Facebook, not to YouTube. Um, but we're going to send you the link to that too. Uh, integrated learning webinar will be really helpful, fantastic. Um, how about creating a topic on the timetable called STEM? Ah, uh, no, teacher Collins, I don't, I won't recommend that. Don't call it STEM. You want to integrate STEM to all your subjects. That's the goal. So whether you are teaching music or you are teaching uh, fine art or you are teaching um, literacy or social studies, the goal is trying to integrate those STEM approaches, scientific pro method, project-based learning, trying to integrate it. Don't put a subject called STEM. Um, I think that is going to kind of defeat the aim. A question that came to my mind is, how do we really apply this STEM approach and still prepare them to pass their qualifying exams like YEC, FSLC? As parents, if these skills are built into our awards, we don't need them to get to 30 over 30 in a test, and they can, and they can if so exceptional. The truth is this. When you do STEM-based learning, your students will still pass exam. They cannot fail exam because now they understand. Now they understand. The only problem is if the system itself is not built to check understanding, a system built to check remembering will likely fail students who are on, who are at the operating at the understanding level. That means a student is operating higher than the system. But truth is, to your mother question, students will still pass exams. They will still pass exams. I mean, so in our school, we do, we, we do some of those things. The truth is they will still pass exam. And beyond passing exam, they will really be able to go out there and they can talk, they can engage. When they stand to talk, we'll be like, where are these guys coming from? Where, did they, where are we training these kids? That's the advantage of putting STEM in that. I'm a sales manager. I joined the course. I wanted to be part of this webinar and learn. But amazingly, I got to learn skills that can be applicable even to managing a team. Yeah, really. So yeah, I'm excited. I'm happy to hear that kind of feedback. The truth is, STEM is applicable everywhere. The reason we have people that cannot find jobs and companies cannot find employees is because that STEM is the missing link. And for me, that was the goal of this webinar. I'm aware the book of the book. One reason I couldn't I couldn't act on this purchase at the SARC program a few months ago was actually how to implement without the right resource person. Uh, okay, Ma, let's 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 get to talk. Let's get to talk. Let's see how we can help. Um, I think there are people um around this Victor on this webinar. Victor is in Jaws. I don't know if his team can do anything in Kaduna or there, but yeah, let's get to talk and we'll see what is possible. So I think that um Questions have been answered. Okay, I'm homeschooling for my nine-year-old boy. Please excuse. Join after your presentation. Are there any recommendations or materials I can explore? Um, nine-year-old homeschooling. Are there recommendations or materials I can explore? Uh, yes, there are for homeschooling. Uh, so if you are homeschooling, that means you're, you're, you have. That means you are actually the one. Um, Okay, let me just, this question, what's the name for the book for winning with your boss? 360 degree leadership. 360 degrees leadership by John C. Uh, Maxwell. Um, so for somebody who is doing home homeschooling, I know there are experts on this group. Let me not pretend to know all the answers. I think there are school owners here who know better than me on homeschooling. What resources will you recommend for somebody homeschooling a nine-year-old? Uh, I'm going to call out some names. Dr. Elizabeth, I think you have an answer here. Please come and help, help this person. Somebody's homeschooling. I mean, well, that's a very courageous decision. Homeschooling is very courageous and it has a lot of benefits. I recently met somebody who homeschooled his children those guys are doing amazing things. By 16, they have certifications. They can work anywhere because they just, that border too, there's no holiday. They just say, okay, this month we are traveling and the entire learning is built into the travel. So they travel, drive around or travel somewhere and they learn. So, but 
Um, can somebody help I recommend what resources or materials for somebody homeschooling at a child for a child of nine years? Dr. Elizabeth, are you here? Please, can you unmute yourself? Or anybody, you can drop in the chat, you can unmute yourself and speak. If you've done homeschooling before, please help us out here. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, there are resources out there. So um, we can get to talk. I'm going to drop my, e uh, the person should drop his or her email here. So we can send some resources. Okay, yes, there are quite a number. Yes, we may also need to get to know um, this person's area of interest for the nine-year-old. So, can I ask, start? To what country are you? Where are you? Where are you joining from? I think that's also going to help. Okay, the, the email is there. I think you're in South Africa. From your email. Correct. Yes, I'm. I'm from South Africa. Okay. Are you living in South Africa? Yes. Yes, I'm here now. Okay, great. Okay, so um, please, Daniel, take that email and somebody is going to get in touch with her to, to just probably help with resources for that. But I must say again, um, congratulations on that courageous decision to homeschool your children. That's really a fantastic um, move you've made. So yeah, just keep at it. Someone is going to get across to you and hopefully you will get good links and resources. All right. I must thank everybody who made it to this webinar. I hope it was a helpful time. I hope it was educative. I hope it was that there's some value that you got for your two hours, ended up spending almost two hours. Um, in two weeks from now, we're gonna be having another webinar. And this one, I, I, I love this one. It's called, it said, Helping Children Develop Grit. Um, so I'm just gonna put up the screen here. Yeah, yeah, so that's it. Um, if you can see the screen, that's the webinar. It's gonna hold exactly two Sundays from today. Proven strategies for helping young learners develop the most one of the most important ingredients for a successful life. Grit, that ability to, to not give up. That's to say, I'm going to keep going, I'm going to keep going. When things are not working, I'm going to keep going. That is what we're going to be exploring. So as a teacher, what activities can you do? What things can you, how do you develop grit? How do you develop resilient children who are going to go out there and are going to refuse to give up, refuse to be beaten down and just stand out there and succeed into this world? That's going to be the topic of our next webinar. So Daniel, there's another email. There's somebody also homeschooling five to 10 years old. The email is there. Please, Daniel, take down the email so that we can help that person too. So for um, the school in Kaduna, we're going to get in touch with you. We we might be able to provide, it depends, it depends. We have a team. We have a team that provides services in Lagos, in Ibadan, um, in Uyo here. We might be able to get someone to, down to Kaduna, but let's get talking after now. Thank you very much for your time. And um, I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful rest of the evening. God bless you and see you in two weeks time. You're going to get emails from us about the links or for the, to play, get the replay. And until then, see you. Thank you very much. Have a lovely evening. Bye-bye.